What's up guys, welcome back. New video today, new car and something different that we've not done before. So hopefully I'll keep this one nice and short and sweet for you all. But we've got here a big bad Hilux, full pre-runner spec as you can see, fully pumped fiberglass guards, apparently built by a bloke in Brisbane. Uh, don't ask me who, I do not know. I'll try and find out from the owner before I air the video and put it in the description for you guys. Uh, full log arm kit in the front end. As you can see, it's a really, really, really nice ute. Big fan, really like it. Inside, under the bonnet, we've got ourselves a 3RZ. Mighty Toyota 2.7 litre four cylinder square bore engine. And the things are wicked. Always been a huge fan of the 3RZ. I've convinced mates to turbo 3RZs before. Never had one ourselves, never been able to dyno one, but we are huge fans. It's classic Toyota's 90s over engineering, but just in a four cylinder, that's fairly big capacity. These things are friggin' wicked. So it's a completely stock 3RZ. I don't know a lot about this platform and these Hiluxes particularly, but the owner has assured me that these are the R150 gearbox, which means we do have the good strong gearbox in this thing, which is awesome. So we've got a six boost high mount manifold with a Garrett GDX 3071 and a turbo smart wastegate. Then we just got some good injectors with a FBR 800 and an intercooler from Aeroflow. And as you can see, it's a fairly basic setup on a completely stock engine. The customer actually originally hit us up to buy an ECU. He wanted to buy an ECU to run this thing. He did have it running on the standard ECU for a little while and it has survived at about seven pounds, but he decided to put some decent engine management in it, which is a really, really good idea. So. I pointed him in the direction of Whitey's wiring because I know that Whitey's was doing patch looms for both Link and Haltech to go straight to the 3RZ, which essentially made it a plug and play affair, which is a really, really awesome way to go. And I knew that Sam was gonna do that and he's a dealer for ECUs as well. So I just said, go talk to Sam, he'll do you a deal on a package for an ECU and a patch loom. So that's exactly what he's done. We ended up with a Haltech Elite 550 in this thing with one of Whitey's wiring's patch looms. So apart from that, the other wiring is otherwise stock, which is awesome. We've got just a AFR wideband gauge. Uh, a lot of these gauges, the aftermarket ones, they do have analog outputs, which are usually zero to five volt, which you can actually wire into the ECU's analog voltage input and then actually have wideband into the ECU, which allows us to do all of our closed loop fuel trims, as well as protections against lean outs and all that sort of thing. So we've still got to wire that in. That's pretty much all we've got to do. And then this thing's ready to hit the dyno. So I've got a wideband up here. It goes down to a control box down under the dash, which is what actually runs the sensor and the heater and everything else. And from that control box, there is a analog output, which we are going to wire over to the Elite 550 into one of the analog voltage inputs and have an actual input for the wideband. The owner was gonna do this first before it came here, but he actually just didn't have the right pins to pin it into the Haltech. So um, I figured easy enough for us to do it. We've got heaps of pins here, that's fine. And the plan at this point is to run this thing up to the owner's requested around 14 PSI, but obviously just stop where it's happy. So we'll uh, see what this thing can do. I'm hoping that it can make around 280, 280 wheel horsepower. It's just on 98, so let's find out. So the other thing at the moment is that his fabricator has been too busy to finish the exhaust off. So at the moment it only has a full two and a half inch exhaust and it will eventually have a complete three inch. So not sure how much that's going to hold us up at the power that we want to make with this thing, but that is something to note as well. So once he gets the three inch done, he's going to bring it back. We'll run it up again, just make sure it's all sweet and he'll be on his way. But for now, we're just going to tune it to the two and a half inch because he's going to drive it around with that for a little while. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can make some good pepper out of this thing. All right, guys, just working on our little subloom for our wide band into the ECU. As always, open barrel crimps, good heat shrink, good braid. No excuse in this day and age for doing shitty wiring on cars, guys. There we go, little subloom, TFX wire, open barrel crimps, good crimps. We've got the Haldeck crimp on the end there. The other one's an earth, and I'll hijack another earth in the uh, ECU loom, and that will give us air input. Happy days. All right, we're all wired in. Yeehaw. We're on the dyno, ready for tomorrow. Get everything happening. I couldn't even just set it up in the ECU this afternoon. Had issues with not being able to connect to this thing. And uh, I kept trying and trying, it wouldn't connect. I had this hunch that uh, because it's fairly new, it's only just been purchased and installed, uh, that it probably already has the updated firmware for NSP, which I messaged the owner and have confirmed that that is the case. So normally that wouldn't be an issue at all, but because at the moment we don't have any phone service or internet at all, I cannot download NSP. So this will be the first time we've played with NSP. So a few exciting firsts with this thing. They're looking forward to it. So we'll do that tomorrow. I'll update the computer tonight when I go home where I have internet. 
We'll sort it out in the morning. Righto guys, back here this morning. We've got an SP now, it's getting this thing set up. We've got our knock sensor on for the Plex, getting ready. Righto guys, moving along. <coughs> Was experimenting with some IAT stuff, that's why it's sticking up, but it didn't make any difference, so I'll put it back down. But uh, we do have some issues with fuel. So pretty standard guys, as you've been watching for a long time, that number one issue with pretty much any any tuner we'll find with any cars that come through their workshop the number one most common issue is fueling fuel supply fuel pumps that are too big for wiring draw too much current get too hot don't keep up with fuel demand that sort of thing basically not maintaining fuel pressure and unfortunately this thing's no exception we're having some fuel issues the uh the fuel pressure is just dropping off hard so originally it was doing it real early like around this three and a half thousand rpm so we sort of decided that obviously it was going to need looking at unfortunately for this thing you've got to drop the tank to get at the pump the boys have said that they put a pretty sure it's a brand new walbro 255 in tank which are normally pretty good they don't draw a heap of current which means that most cars the standard wiring is sufficient enough to run them so we'll have a look at it and see what happens but i had an idea that before i pull it off the dyno i just wanted to make sure that it wasn't pressure in the fuel tank so i pulled the fuel cap off just to ensure that that wasn't an issue and sure enough these other ones you can see here, which maintained actual better AFRs for way more of the run. That's after I pulled the full fuel cap off the fuel tank. So obviously pressure in the fuel tank was part of the issue, but it wasn't the only issue because I filmed the fuel pressure gauge on the regulator and sure enough, this was not responding to any fuel changes on the map. And sure enough, it's still dropping off pressure up in the top end. So there is still an issue there, but uh, at least we know that vacuum in the tank is, is an issue as well. So we can look at that. So. Unfortunately, another one of those cars we're gonna to have to pull off, chuck it on the hoist and start investigating. Uh, and as you can see, boost control is a bit of a problem. This is usually reminiscent of a gate being too small or not enough priority flow. We'll see what happens. We had planned to run about 14 pound, um, which I expected mid to tie 200s. Already at 220 with what's in there. There's hardly any timing in it. So it's looking pretty good as far as that goes, but we'll just keep on. It sounds rude though. <laughs> Poor old four cylinders. They just don't sound good. So we have got this tank pretty much ready to come out now. Um, the other thing obviously is fuel filter is going to be the next thing. I'll send the owner a message and just ask when the last time the filter was changed was. The tank's out, looks nice and clean inside, that all looks fine. Uh, the actual pump install is really quite good. It's really not that bad at all. Now, the only thing is they haven't used, which is a common mistake that most people make, is um, when you put heat shrink inside a fuel tank and even fuel line, uh, you have to use special stuff that is rated for chemicals so things like regular heat shrink they don't last the fuel sort of just eats them they just get to a point like you can see with this one where it just slips down but that being said the way that this has been wired up it's not really necessarily needing heat shrink anyway there's nothing really at risk with that heat shrink there so um the heat shrink we use is called dr25 it's a special chemical resistant heat shrink uh it's a brand new pump as you can see like i was saying standard wiring is quite beefy for something like a 255 that it should only really draw about seven amps that should be plenty big enough wiring and that connector should be plenty big enough for it as well so you know about the only thing we're going to do is while we're here and we've got it out we're going to just swap out this hose so regular fuel hose is rated to have fuel inside it but it's not rated to have fuel on the outside of it so the actual rubber sheathing on the outside once it's submerged in fuel will actually break down over time and go all gross and it'll eventually ruin the line so you actually can buy special submersible fuel line which is designed to be submersed in fuel this may be submersible fuel line we don't know but just it's a little bit cracked and looking a bit worse for wear and we just figured while we're here we may as well just change it out right oh that's sorted rex just pulled this filter off got another one on the way this afternoon which is awesome given the issues that we had with the tank not breathing we're going to just put a, another breather in the overflow line for the filler It'll alleviate the issue that we have but uh have the filter on it we should stop contaminants getting in the fuel um and should be happy days Oh, snoo! They're kind of idiot proof it too, which is nice. That is nice. This is like a little locator. Little locator lump, so you can't put it in the wrong way. And then that little clip's got a little locator as well, so you can't put it in the wrong way. You know, right on. the second time. Because <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> Take two, we'll try this again.
Righto guys, still no good. So obviously is an issue. The only other thing that we can think of, besides obviously a pump on the way out at the moment, is the way that the boys have used rivets to actually connect the electrical connections for the pump in the tank. Perhaps they're not supplying enough of a uh, connection for it to work properly. So we'll pull the, pull the tank back out, pull the pump back out. We'll fix them, get rid of the rivets and actually bolt them properly and see if that helps. If that still fails, we've got a spare pump here to chuck in it. So we're getting bloody good at getting this tank in and out. We've drilled out the rivets and got rid of them. You'd think that a rivet would have plenty enough surface area to make it work, but they were sort of not super clean as well. And the rivet on the earth particularly, like it, it hadn't pulled the terminal right down hard onto the body of the hanger. So that could definitely be part of the issue. Alrighty guys, so I just had the owner actually send me the link to the eBay listing where he bought the pump and I'll show you the eBay listing. Uh, so you can see here, Walbro listing, list is a Walbro 55, uh, 255 sorry, but you can see it's all in a Walbro box and stuff. Now genuine Walbro does not come like this anymore. And the other thing is this pump was $75. So if it's too good to be true, chances are it's not true. <laughs> so for $75, you would not get yourself a genuine Walbro 255. This is what a genuine Walbro, which is now TO Automotive 255, looks like these days now. So given that we can sort of see that that is pretty obviously the listing, I'm not too confident with it. We are just going to go ahead and fit the genuine pump in it right now. It probably would be nice to actually fit this pump back in to see whether those rivets were actually a problem at all. Would have been nice to sort of know conclusively, but I'm very convinced that we are wasting our time doing that because I really don't think this pump's going to be any chop. So anyway, guys, it's a super common thing. We see it all the time. People buying cheap stuff off eBay. And again, there's some things you can get away with doing, but fuel system components and particularly sensors as well. Just they don't, it never works. You always end up paying twice. But it is, it is a mistake that a lot of people make. All of these listings claim to be genuine. And like I said, there are legitimate good sales on eBay from legitimate places that actually do sell genuine things. Like I'm pretty sure EFI Hardware have an eBay shop where they sell a lot of stuff through eBay and a lot of their stuff is genuine. So it's not everything, but it is just a good idea to talk to a reputable seller and get an idea before ordering really cheap stuff. But anyway. So you even look at this, this is the plug and wire that came with the genuine TI Automotive unit. And look at the gauge of the wire compared to what we pulled out of the tank from the other pump. So things like that is sort of the differences between real and fake. And you can see how different it is in the top, the connections. So, Like I said, guys, it's an easy mistake to make. Pretty sure everyone that's ever built a car has made the mistake before. And that's why they know not to do it anymore. <laughs> anyway, this pump can go directly into the bin. Before we do send it to the dump, though, we are going to steal the little gauze pickup off the fake one. Because for whatever reason, the last heap of these 245s that we've gotten, have got these weird angled feet ones on them. Um, I don't know if there might be a different part number that has a different pickup in them, but for whatever reason, the last fair few we've gotten have all had these, and they don't fit a lot of applications, a lot of tanks, they're a real pain in the ass. so I'm going to put this one back on it because it suits the tank better. Fresh install, genuine pump. Back in business. Back in for the last time. Let's get it. Third time to charm. There you go guys, our fueling issues are sorted. So now it's just a matter of retuning around actual fuel pressure. This thing will be back on its way. More dramas. I really need to stop telling you at the start of these videos that I want to make them short and sweet because <laughs> I keep not turning into that. So anyway, we've sorted out the fuel issues, as you saw. Um, freaking awesome. Revving all the way out now. I had to change a lot of the map. But we are, as you can see, boost control is going to be an issue the way this is set up. Not too big of a deal at the moment. This is though. Whoa, oil. <laughs> so what's happened is the feed line for the turbo comes out of a sandwich block and it comes out of the block, runs straight back and just runs just past the dump pipe as it comes up around the back and onto the turbo and where it's just contacted the dump pipe now, it's melted through and um, split the line. So another fairly common thing that we do see, you do have to be really careful. The braid in the lines is not for heat resistance. Just because they're braided 
Does it make them heat proof? And the braid is for pressure. It's for holding in really high pressures. It makes them very high pressure rated, <laughs> but heat will just melt the PTFE inside the, the braid and um, you'll end up splitting the lines if you've got them resting on manifolds and stuff. So uh, it's another thing you just gotta be real careful of, so. So the boost control is an interesting one. Um, like obviously we were seeing this uh, yesterday that it was going to be an issue, but it's a six boost manifold and it's a 45 mil turbo smart gate. So by all accounts, like six boost isn't the best pr for priority flow, but um, it should be able to deal with this combo easy enough. So a bit of a strange one. We're contemplating actually dropping the two and a half inch exhaust off the dump pipe just to eliminate the exhaust out of the situation. Um, but yeah, a bit of a strange one. That being said, I have no idea what the rear housing is on this 3071, not a clue, so. So you can see there where it started to singe the braid and that'll be likely where it's um, melted through the PTFE if the camera would ever focus. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. So, back in. Fire away from the dump this time. We managed to just cut the damage part out and re-terminate the same line. Routed it a different way which kept it away from the dump but it was still long enough. So, that's awesome that it's, you know, it doesn't cost much. So, uh, got out of that pretty well. Sorted for now. Keep going. guys cracking along it's going all right um so these have all loaded up in the wrong order so they actually start from the bottom go up but you can see um what was going on here we're having these boost control problems started to add timing each one of these lines was adding a degree of timing back in and as you can see it gets less and less and less so as you're adding timing you're taking energy out of the turbine you're taking energy out of the exhaust which sort of brings the the boost down because it doesn't have to cope with so much exhaust gas energy uh, but it's a very fine line. So this last one here, the red one where we made 225, um, it was very unhappy. Uh, it started to get very loud. So we've gone back, we pulled those two degrees back out and we're back to where the green one is at 221. But that's a very fine line of um, how happy this thing is to not be too retarded to make too much exhaust gas energy, but you don't have too much timing in it that's gonna start knocking, so. So we do firmly believe that um, this thing would be a lot happier with a three inch exhaust. We reckon it would probably be a lot happier taking a bit more timing with that three inch exhaust and not backing up so much energy. But for now, we'll see what we can do. But the fact that with that timing, we've brought that boost control down to a reasonable level. We're gonna chuck the boost T in it now and try a little bit more boost and see what we can do. Hopefully we can get this thing to a fairly nice, somewhere between sort of 12, 14 pound.
Right, oh guys, so we dropped the exhaust at the dump just as an experiment to see what was going on. Uh, that 273 is about all this thing's going to do uh, in the in the guise that it's in. But we wanted to sort of see whether the exhaust, the back pressure was having a huge effect on the boost control. What we found is that with the exhaust dropped at the dump, with the exhaust flow actually working better, uh, the turbine's working more efficiently, uh, and we're actually, the boost control's worse, which points it completely towards an issue with the wastegate, uh, whether it is an issue with priority flow or the wastegate itself, we're not sure. But as you can see, like that was that 273 run, the red one. Without touching the boost T, dropping the exhaust, you can see how, wor how much worse this was. And then we actually clicked it back, one click on the boost T, and you can see it was just starting to take off. So it's actually made the boost control worse because with the turbine working more efficiently, the system has to bypass more gas to control boost, which it is not doing because obviously there's something wrong with the wastegate setup. So trying to debate whether we go looking for it. I just, I can't understand why at 270 horsepower, um, even if, even though it's a six boost and we know that the priority flow is not that great, this 45 mil gate should be doing plenty. Um, it should really should be. So it really does seem like there's an issue, perhaps a pinched diaphragm. It's not allowing the gate to open all the way, perhaps a blockage or something like that. I don't know. It just seems strange. So should figure, figuring out how far do we go with it. All right, we did one more run just as an experiment, this one here, and we did just completely boost T closed, completely on gate pressure. And as you can see, it's even worse than it was with the exhaust on, which just, and look at, just looking at it, it really doesn't seem like the gate's in a very bad spot as far as priority flow. It seems to come off the manifold at a pretty good place. And there is just no reason a 45 mil gate shouldn't be controlling this properly. So I think we're going to go ahead and pull it off and just have a look um, because it's just not right. But that experiment does prove that the two and a half inch exhaust is choking the shit out of this thing, particularly up top. Um, so at least there's that. So there appears to be no blockages or any issues with the screamer. So time to pull this gate off. How good is this? See how hard that would be to get to? But look at what the boys have done. Made a little hole so you can easily get it on and off. There's you in your head. It happened all the way. Hmm. Appears to be all the way. All right, so we've confirmed that's as far as the gate opens. There's no pinches, nothing abnormal in the diaphragm. The whole thing looks fine. And looking down the gate port on the manifold, you can pretty much see straight into the collector. It really doesn't appear to be a, a terribly bad path for the gas um, as far as priority flow goes. So it seems insane that a 45 mil gate would be too small for this setup. But like I said, that being said, I, we don't know what size the housing is. It is only a 30. So, I don't know. Just seems insane. At the end of the day, there's no conclusive issues. So back together it goes and it just, it is what it is um, at the moment. It's not a huge deal, you know, it is doing what we want it to do at 14 pound. It is working. Um, it just, it doesn't seem right as all to us, but. Hey, just having a brainstorm and a think, and we've actually sort of thought, maybe it has something to do with where the reference for this is taken from on the housing. It would sort of explain why, because um, I haven't talked about it yet, but normally when we have a boost tier like this, uh, especially getting it from completely open or shut, I don't know what you'd say, but basically gate pressure, normally you'd need to go like 20 clicks before you start to actually see any difference. And on this, it is super, super sensitive. So we're wondering if maybe it's something to do with the reference from here, which is causing an issue. Perhaps this point where it's taking the reference is not seeing the boost pressure that it should be. And maybe that's why we're having this problem. So we're gonna try a few more things when it goes back together as far as this reference point goes. Right, so we're back together and to do a test, we're just gonna run the gate reference directly. Tee it off the manifold. Um, obviously we don't like running these gates from a vacuum source, that's his vacuum, but just for testing purposes, this is what we've got, so it'll be gate pressure, and it should be gate pressure based on what the manifold is seeing. And if this doesn't change anything, that's it. It is what it is. <laughs> I give up. We feel a bit silly for not thinking of it earlier, <laughs> before we pulled the whole gate and screamer setup apart. But 
here you go guys so pink run was with our reference to manifold blue one we just did another run where we put it back to the original reference on the turbo just to see if it make any difference because the red one was when we had no exhaust on it so as you can see literally no difference so that is not the problem it has nothing to do with it they're pretty much exactly the same follow the line for line and we're officially out of ideas we have no idea really couldn't tell you why this thing's having boost control issues doesn't make any sense to us ought to just be something to do with the manifold design don't know but i mean we've already spent a lot of time on this thing at this stage it does work like we said a couple of clicks on that boost t 14 pound stays consistent and steady it's holding 14 pound it's doing well 270 with the wheels horsepower which is friggin plenty for one of these things it's gonna be sick um so you know the combo is working at the moment so it's not a huge deal it's just because of the people we are we just really really wanted to understand why it's having issues but so obviously guys goes without saying the old boost t is um a very primitive way of doing boost control um not something we normally do in this day and age but it's what i was on this car uh the elite 550 has the provisions has the capability to run a mac valve and do uh ecu control boost which is probably if he wants to go for a three inch exhaust he wants to do that uh we'd definitely be looking at going to a mac valve and ecu control boost that way we could try and at least um you know if this is going to creep up to sort of 16 pound or whatever uh we can at least taper off the duty cycle towards the end and get this sort of running at a fairly consistent maybe 15 16 pound instead of having it just a few clicks in and just you know taking off anyway guys short of actually pulling the turbo housing like off and having a look at the manifold the collector design and having a look at the housing and stuff but we can't really give any more answers on why it's doing what it's doing it really shouldn't be by all accounts but anyway that is what it is but that's the hilux pretty much sorted 270 at the wheels guys I'm back what a weapon this thing's mint so i didn't film it this morning but we just did a few more tests this morning on the dyno just because of how sensitive the clicker on the boost t was yesterday and how much like one click was changing boost and how different things were being uh, i just wanted to do a few more tests and we've actually ended up having to dial it back one click on the t uh, so what we found was that because this thing's having real bad iot issues that's one of the biggest issues we have with this thing at the moment is iot's um, with that it's only got a little air cooler on it it's not doing the job it's not cutting it uh so at the end of a full throttle run on the dyno we're seeing 60 degrees intake air temp uh which is obviously losing a lot of density in that air and uh what we found was where we had the boost t set yesterday when it was hot it was fine but when we're trying to run it up before it's got heat into it and the air is not as hot everything's not as hot and there's a lot more density in the air it was boost spiking like crazy uh which is what we don't want to do um so we ended up having to turn it back one unfortunately it's just a consequence of just having a boosty uh, like i was saying it's pretty 
old school way of doing this. So, because there's no other way to control it or correct it, because it's just a raw value of how much air is bleeding off, there's no way for us to sort that out. So, in order to keep it safe, we had to just come back on one T. So, basically where it's ended up is when everything's at operating temp and it's actually getting those IATs, it's around that 250 horsepower. It's not quite the 270 that we were getting with, with the full boost that we wanted to get into it. But um, at least now when it's cold and it's boosting, it's only getting around that, uh, you know, that 14, 15 pound rather than us leaving it at 14 pound while it's hot and it's spiking to 17, 18 pound when it's cold. So I've told the owner, I've talked to him about the fact that if he gets a three inch exhaust, I really want to put a Mac valve in this thing, go to ECU control boost. You can't do full closed loop with the 550, but you can at the very least set up duty cycle corrections for intake air temp which means we can at least adjust the duty cycle based on the IATs and get this thing fairly consistent the way it is. But I, I have told him about the intercooler as well, about it could really do with a better intercooler. So fingers crossed when he does go through with the exhaust, he can put a, a better intercooler on it as well and a Mac valve too. And that'll sort of hopefully knock all of our problems on the head. And from there, we should be able to sort this thing out. Anyway, guys, as you saw from the driving footage, even where it is, it's still a handful. It is cool. The spill on this thing is just ridiculous. It sounds like a Kenworth. It's just cool. So anyway, that's the uh, 3RZ Hilux. Hope you've enjoyed this one. Something a bit different. It's been fun doing something new. And I know a lot of people who watch this and think a lot of bad stuff happened, but this is literally pretty much ev every single car that comes through. Um, they all have problems. It's just the unglamorous side of tuning. It's not this one particularly. <laughs> it's just what happens. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one. Smash like, smash subscribe. Peace out. See you, boy.